if you teach someone you know, in a static way, they might retain some of that knowledge. But if you teach someone with the intent of them teaching others. Meet Aleem Danji, Chief People Officer at Equinox. With decades of experience leading global brands like Adidas and Citigroup, Aleem's dedication to the philosophy of servant leadership has enabled him to cultivate an organizational culture at Equinox that not only fosters personal growth, but also drives financial results. If innovation is important, then how are we uh, constantly taking risk and, and, and learning from each other, learning from failures and supporting each other in that sort of environment of, of, of pushing um, ahead. Um, but it's also, it requires collaboration and it, it requires being much more creative because you, we're, we're not looking at a template. I'm Dr. Jessica Kriegel, and this is Culture Leaders, where we decode the magic behind the masters of movements to unleash the power of culture. This is the story of Aleem Danji, a master of a movement to integrate wellness, innovation, and community into the workplace. You're listening to a Culture Partners production. So, Aleem, what is your why? My why um, on on most days it's getting from the bedroom to the to the kitchen without stepping on Lego blocks and then going through excruciating <laughs> pain. Um, but once I get past that, which which is a feat, um, it's probably quite common and 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 perhaps a little bit cheesy, but it's to make uh, you know positive impact in the world um, through empowering others. And and I think that that gets adopted in how I think about my kids and and raising them to be um, contributing members of society, self-empowered, et cetera. But it's also a responsibility that translates into, into leadership and in making sure that you build strong teams and are a servant leader. Um, so I kind of subscribe to those ethos. That's a force multiplier when you can help others be their very best. Um, and it's, it's a good feeling when you, when you take um, someone or an organization from one state to another, it's always about forward momentum. Uh, so that that is that is probably my why. Mm, that's beautiful. What is the Equinox why? Is there a mission statement? It's quite simple, which is it's not fitness, it's life. And um, there's a lot in that to unpack in the sense that, um, you know, it's not about just going to the gym. It is how we think about uh, nutrition, regeneration, movement. Uh, so it's not just what you do in the gym, but also what you do outside of the gym and gives you that sense of wellness and, and helps you balance your mental health. And it's about optimal living. So it's um, very consistent with my own why around maximizing impact. Do you feel like you're able to fulfill your own personal why more here in this role than in your previous role at Adidas? I mean, does the mission alignment feel greater or were you doing it just as well there as well? I think it, it's portable, um, and and certainly I've picked opportunities and also which which companies um, I I join because there's an alignment in in their mission and, and my mission. Um, I find most often when when you don't strive for that alignment, it, it's hard to get that gratification um, because there'll there'll be misalignment. Um, mm. For sure, being part of Equinox, it's helped me keep up with my commitment around fitness because my colleagues will call me out on it, but yeah, it, 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 it serves a different purpose in that sense. Well, that's actually a question I have. So is there a lot of pressure to be a fitness buff if you work there, even in the corporate office? I wouldn't say pressure because I do see a lot of carbs around me and, and, and people are surprised <laughs> when I, when I, when, when I talk about the, the cakes and pastries and we had a cookie competition the other day, um, it's, it's more the inspiration. You know, we, we have some amazing talent, uh, group fitness instructors, personal trainers who are former Olympians, Broadway stars, and you can't help but be inspired by their journey. Um, and so I think that that's where I get the energy from. Mm, that's beautiful. So one of the questions we get a lot is around the interplay of workplace culture and national culture. What trumps which? And you've had a lot of 
diverse international experience. And so I was wondering if you could share your insight about country culture versus workplace culture in global organizations. Oh, that's that's a tough question. I haven't gotten that before. Um, <laughs> look, I, I, I think I think that there is probably some alignment between how companies culture um, manifests itself in an in international culture. So, for example, I worked at Adidas and I was in the head office uh, in Germany. And I, I do think that there are certain values um, that manifest itself in, in the headquarters company because of where we're situated in Germany. Um, and, you know, wh whether it's a, a, a national stereotype or not, the, the focus around process excellence and efficiency, um, I do think manifested itself in, in headquarters. However, if you go to our North American headquarters, which is in Portland, um, I do think that some of the values of, of, the, of the country were, were manifesting in, in, in the culture over there. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And I think that that's a richness that comes out of working in a global organization because you get this sort of confluence of national cultures and um, uh, the diversity of the people. It, it, it's, it's less about a dominant culture and more about different cultures contribute, contributing to something bigger. Okay, wow. So you, tell us about where you've worked and what is your favorite country to work in and, and what is it like working internationally versus working in the U.S. for a largely U.S. audience? What is it like elsewhere? So I've been to a number of different countries um, and I'm surprised that I'm still in the same relationship for 20 years because we've moved 14 times. Um, oh my goodness. Which is crazy. But, but I've lived in six countries and um, my very first expat assignment was in Hong Kong. And that still remains to me um, my favorite because it's such a hyper competitive uh, environment. This is back then, but it's sort of that, that convergence of, of financial services and, and the, the, the drumbeat that comes with financial services, but also fashion. So you have this mix of culture and, and the latest and greatest and trends in music. Um, but there's also a very rich expat community in Hong Kong. And so I was, I was able to be a part of that. And so on one hand, I was on the other side of the world. But on, on the other hand, I was part of a group that was also experiencing the same. And, and, and that was quite powerful in uh, building new relationships, getting out of your comfort zone um, and, and learning about um, a different part of the world. I've lived in, in Germany, as I mentioned, I've lived in, in Canada for most of my life. I've lived in Australia and Tanzania. Um, so I think, you know, to your question, how does that compare to being just in the U.S.? Um, so we are, we are predominantly in the U.S., but we are also in, in, in the U.K. and Canada. Um, and I think part of the reason why I got this role was that I bring a global mindset. And, and so although we are primarily a U.S. market, uh, our growth potential and how we scale the organization is no doubt going to be international markets. And so that, that's something that's exciting because that doesn't happen overnight, even though, even though that might not be for 12 to 24 months, you have to start working on it now. The DNA in the organization has to evolve in order for us to be a more global organization. Wow. So... Tell us about the commitment that the organization has had to diversity and inclusion and, and how those principles operate at a day-to-day -day level and in the long-term strategy at Equinox. What, what, is, what is your take on that? Yeah, so I Equinox, um, and I was a member 12, 13 years ago I rem uh, you know, when I was in Toronto, and so I didn't know much about them, to be quite honest. And when the search firm called me, um, I, I had to take a minute to really understand, you know, the breadth and depth of Equinox Group. Um, and within that, I also did a lot of research. And what I found was that the, the history for supporting um, DEI was much more organic. It wasn't driven off of um, targets or, or some type of compliance requirement. It was literally, you know, the, the, the workforce is, is very um, open and collaborative. We call our workforce a community. You never hear the, you know, rarely hear the term employees. It's all about the community. 
And we've got very rich and vibrant ERGs that are active. So there's always something every day, every week, there's something that the ERG is doing. Um, and so it's very much part of the fabric. It's, it's not sort of an event or episodic. Um, it, it's just part of who we are. And so have you, you've seen, I'm sure, in the news, this, this pulling away from interest or investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion. What has your response been internally? Have you had at the corporate executive level conversations about this? What are, how is what you're doing different from, from others in your experience? Yeah, so our, our team is, is guided by um, fundamental principles of do the right thing for our people and for our, com our extended community, our members. And so we, we have been doing this for a very long time. Um, we've got a very large, for example, LGBT community. We've got many employees who are trans. Um, we've got a significant diversity right across the board. And we, we respect that there are differences of opinions, um, but we all come together as a community and make sure that we are um, supporting the mission of the company and also respecting the differences and not just respecting, but celebrating the differences of our, of our own community as well as our, 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 the members that, uh, that we deliver service to. Hmm. What, so going back to the Equinox purpose, when you talked about it's not just fitness, it's life. I think there's a lot of organizations trying to find that balance between work and life, but beyond work-life balance, really bringing your whole self to work and finding fulfillment and wholeness at work. Is there anything that you are doing at Equinox internally that you think is innovative or different to help to speak to that mission? I, I mean, I'd have to say that we, we practice what we preach. Um, so when we, when we think about the fundamentals of, of our proposition, which is MNR, um, movement, nutrition, rejuvenation, regeneration, we support that. So everyone in our club has access to the club. Everyone in our company has access to the club. Uh, in, in corporate, you see throughout the day people going downstairs. We have a, an amazing um, access to the Hudson Yards uh, club, and people take advantage of that. But it's also um, through our app, we offer um, meditation and sound baths and all kinds of other resources that people can find balance in what, whatever way balance is for them. Um, and, and for some people, that might mean taking half an hour, an hour during the day to, to get a workout in. And they shouldn't feel um, uh, scared to do that or, or guilty to do that. Um, it is important part of um, investing in yourself in order to give to others. So you see that? You see people taking off in the middle of the day saying, I'm going to go get a workout in? Definitely. And it's not just certain levels. Um, you know, our CFO loves to get in a soul cycle ride during the day. Um, I'm, I'm a morning person, so I'm, I'm one of those crazies who's at the club at 5 a.m. And um, I just find that that's my hour and, and uh, it's, the, it's the way that I start my day. When I miss my workout, then my team knows that I'm a bit sluggish that day and, and uh, it'll probably be a tougher day for all of us. But I try, to, I try to do that for myself first thing in the morning. So are there any projects or initiatives that you're working on right now that are particularly exciting or things that are coming up? One, one in particular um, is, it doesn't sound too exciting or sexy, but it is about re-onboarding a company. And where that, where that came from is that we've gone through, especially hospitality in our industry, um, such a, a, a massive moment through the pandemic where the company almost flatlined and the industry was hit the hardest. So you've got people that were in, in Equinox group pre-2019, and then we've recruited a whole bunch of new people thereafter. And it seems that, and then we also, also in corporate, of course, have had hybrid work. So we've got different groups of people that have a different understanding of what Equinox really means. And one of the things that we wanted to think about for 2024 is how do we create a cultural moment for everyone to go through the gate together and create this common denominator of what do we stand for? How do we bring exceptional legendary experiences for our members? And how do we support each other as a community? And so we're organizing in June 
this week of um, cultural experiences and events that are going to be the re-onboarding of the company. And it will then serve as the on onboarding ritual for anyone else who comes into the company. So I'm really excited about that. So what are you really, are you, is everyone going? How are you doing a week? Yeah, so I, I, I'm probably going to get many leaders here nervous when I say we're going to dedicate a full week. But we're, we're, it's a week because we've got lots of people in our clubs who are gig workers or work shifts. And, and so if we keep it a certain day, we're likely going to miss many people. And so it's going to be delivered throughout a week, different sessions, different experiences. Some of it is going to be in person uh, within the club. There are going to be activations and some of it is going to be virtual through our learning experience platform. There's just going to be a, 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 a hybrid uh, rollout and we're going to empower the, the managers to deliver it as well. Because I'm a firm believer that if you invest in creating that capability among managers, that there will be a force multiplier and, and have a halo effect for, for their teams. So it's, it's really delivering that throughout that week. Okay, so it's an event at multiple locations as well as online. So each club okay is hosting this week at various times throughout the week for different events. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Wow, that's really interesting. So then you've created some kind of manager empowerment toolkit or training to get them to know what to do that week at the event. Is that right? And you're trying to create an intentional culture around some new new decided cultural shared cultural beliefs that you're trying to roll out in this new onboarding for everyone all over again. Is that it? Exactly. And, and it kind of ties back to the principle that if you, if you teach someone you know, in a static way, they might retain some of that knowledge, but if you teach someone with the intent of them teaching others, they're going to retain much more of that knowledge. And so by doing that with all our people managers, they're going to, in fact, be the facilitators. We expect for them to embody the principles and the knowledge that we're imparting so that they can repeat it over and over again. So mm. you, you, you get an investment not only in, in culture and creating that moment for everyone and a bit of a ritual. We're all about rituals here at Equinox, but it's also an investment in, in, in leadership capability. What is the culture that is the, those shared beliefs you're trying to roll out? Can you describe what it is you're trying to be intentional around? Yeah, on, on one hand, it, it is about the community and how we, how we work with each other and have that mutual respect for differences, but also um, um, what we're aligned on in terms of delivering value. Um, on the other hand, it's sort of the ethos that make us who we are. We're a category of one. We don't see competitors in our industry that are at this scale that focus on luxury culture and wellness all coming together. And so innovation is super important for us. And, and so if innovation is important, then how are we uh, constantly taking risk and, and, and learning from each other, learning from failures and supporting each other in that sort of environment of, of, of pushing um, ahead? Um, but it's also, it requires collaboration and it, it requires being much more creative because you, we're, we're not looking at a template. We, we don't have another organization to look at and say, oh, this is how they're doing it. We want to keep pushing the, the, the edge. Um, so it's, it's a high performance environment in that sense. But also, on the other hand, we do what we do in service to our members. And we've got hundreds of thousands of members. And uh, you know, I've been at a number of organizations. But in this organization, the, the hard wiring between employee experience and our member experience is, is so strong. So we, we need to be aligned in making sure that we are working on what it means to deliver legendary membership member experience. So we believe that culture is the experiences people have that shape their beliefs, which ultimately drive their actions and therefore get results. So when you say the, the member experience, what, what belief are you hoping to create or shape in the experience you give your members? Yeah, for, for our members, um, you know, we, we believe they choose Equinox, um, partly because we've got 
eucalyptus towels and fancy uh, marble in, in our locker rooms. And it's a good experience. It's a clean experience. But I think they join us because of the talent that we have in the membership community that they're part of. Mm. And, and so that becomes really special. And we have this term where we say we throw the party. If you go at certain hours of, of, of the day and everything is in, is in motion, you've got group fitness classes happening and they're, they're, they're beautiful classes with, with glass and you've got people working out on the strength floor. There's this energy that you feel. And, and, and that's, that's magical because you, get, you draw motivation from it. You draw inspiration from it. How do, you, how do you create that? There's no, you can't learn that in a textbook. You learn from each other and with your colleagues and sharing that best practice. Because ultimately, you know, we want our trainers and, our, and all our club talent to instill a level of confidence and aspiration in our members. And, and from our members to draw from uh, also among themselves. Um, so it's it's really creating community, and I and I think that that's what's really special about what we do. Well, I think that's also interesting because when you say it's not fitness, it's life. The World Happiness Report says that the number one driver of happiness is connection and community, having people. And I think about my own workout history. Not that anyone cares, but when I have been most motivated to work out is when I had a group of people that I was working out with. And we were meeting at the same time. We were either doing kettlebells on our own or we were joining a group fitness class. And it wasn't necessarily about the workout. It was about seeing those people. And by the way, we were working out too. So yeah. do you have intentional ways of connecting people? Because when you join a new gym, even if the vibe is good, you don't know anyone. It can be hard to feel connected, especially in this disconnected world. How do you create intentional experiences to get people to find their people? Yeah, so we, we encourage uh, our members to participate in group fitness because there's nothing better than going into a room with 20, 30 other people. You're going through the same experience together. It's going to be a tough experience. And most of our members know that, you know, we, we've got a lot of proprietary programming um, that is designed um, specifically for Equinox. So you go through this, this really intense program. And at the end of the day, after the session, you feel a sense of accomplishment together. You're all sweaty. You've all burned 600 calories. And you've gone through this, you know, climatic rise and, and then uh, unwinding together. Also, we have Soul Cycle in our portfolio. And that's, if you, I don't know if you've ever gone through a Soul Cycle class, but that is really an emotional experience. You go into this room, it's dimly lit, loud music, you, you're riding to the beat of the music. The, the instructor pushes you and encourages you to go to your maximum. And many times there's true emotion. There are tears that, ha that, 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 that show up because you go, mm. you go through, you break through the ceiling that you thought you had and you feel proud. And then you all go through it together. And, and Soul Cycle is interesting because people actually will, will, you know, their friend group will go together and have a Soul Cycle event. Now, they might also go drinking right after, which fine if, if it works for you, but it's part of the social experience for them. Yeah. So at a corporate level with the employees, I mean, how would you describe the culture currently? You're going through this re-onboarding, right? But what, what words, if I were to randomly call a couple people, what do you, how do you think they would describe the current culture? Yeah, I mean, the top three words that always come up, because I asked that same question in my first 90 days to many people, it's collaborative, creative, entrepreneurial. And although we're a large organization um, with, with scale, it does feel like a startup and that's not in a sort of a negative sense. It, it just means that we figured out how to scale the business, but with the right scaffolding that's invisible. And I think that's important because when you're scaling a business and the scaffolding, and sometimes the scaffolding is introduced by HR people or, or finance or, you know, and, and process becomes a dirty word, but process is just communication. It's how you implement it. And I have a firm believer that if that scaffolding is invisible, which is not easy to do, but it's possible, then you can still put the right guardrails to scale the organization, but you're not going to stifle the creativity. 
And so that's really good to see that after 32 years of Equinox's existence, that that DNA continues. So many organizations have a sort of front line and then they have corporate, right? And you as well, you have, as you said, shift workers, gig workers, people in the clubs working face to face with your members. And then you've also got this corporate system that supports all of those clubs. And are there different cultures there? Are there ways in which you've tried to integrate those two groups or are they not integrated and do they need to be integrated? I think that they need to be integrated um, on some points, but not all. Um, uh, so 97% of our workforce is actually uh, in the clubs. And, um, and, and that's where the energy and the magic really happens. So we encourage everyone in our corporate um, group, and it's not, it's, not a, it's not a massive corporate group, to spend as much time as possible in the clubs. And we have this ritual, which we uh, do at every end of every month, because it's the most important, like most retail organizations, you want to you want to get to your targets. And, and so we have a lot of our corporate leaders out in the clubs that last week of every month. And that energy um, that that is exchanged, they they in the clubs feel the support and, and the recognition from the leaders that are showing up. And likewise, every time I go into the club, I draw energy. And I learned something new about our members, about what's happening in that community. Um, and it's a way for us to be supportive of them. At the end of the day, we are servant leaders that are um, in service of our, our, our people. And our people are in service to their members. Only two groups exist. Um, and so that, that's really at the core of our, of our DNA and how we work between corporate and clubs. Can you tell us an example of, of servant leadership in action at your organization, a time when you've seen someone make a choice to give rather than take or serve rather than whatever the opposite of serve is, right? I mean, how does that look? I, I've seen so many examples of varying leaders who, um, let, let's say, for example, uh, you know, in some clubs, we've got a lean structure. And it's a key moment for sales. And let's say that salesperson is not able to be there because you know they've got a wedding to go to or another commitment. Um, it is not uncommon for one of our leaders to just step in and do that role. There shouldn't be this sort of experience where any leader is too good to do something. Um, so you know, many, many times leaders have stepped in, but but also I think it is um, you know sometimes you'll have conversations and you'll pick up on a sentiment that requires uh, a little bit more attention. And um, I did that recently and, and we, we said, well, you know what, there's, there's, there's something going on here that we need to lean in on and, and just listen. So we, we organized a listening session and we opened it up to whoever in the company wants to engage. And we had a very successful dialogue, very candid, People really appreciated the opportunity, this space and time, uh, you know, to be seen and heard. Um, and, and I think that that, again, forms greater relationships between leadership and, and teams and our community. Um, and it just reinforces the fact that leaders are there to serve you and make you better. Um, but there, there are countless examples I can share about that. I was, this reminds me of some Gary Vanderchuk social media clip that I watched once. And he said, what someone asked him, what three words of advice he would give to any leader out there. And he said, you work for them <laughs> were the three it's so true. words of advice. Yeah. What, if you could go back to the um, young Aleem, beginning of your career Aleem and, and give yourself some advice, um, now upon hindsight 2020 being what it is, what, what advice would you give yourself? Hmm. I got to first accept that I'm not young anymore, but I'm, I, my early, my, <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. My, my, early, my early 20s, that, that is a long time ago. Um, I would probably say to myself, simmer down. It's, it's a marathon. It's a very long marathon. You know, my early 20s, I was very ambitious. I still am ambitious, but the treadmill has probably slowed down a bit, um, especially after you have kids, they teach you patience. Um, yeah, I, I think not worrying. I mean, there, there, there's, 
there, there's a lot to do in life and understanding that there are different business blo uh, building blocks that are important. I sort of call, call them those critical experiences, the badges you collect. Um, and you've got to go through that. There's no, there's no way to accelerate through it. And in the moment, you might not enjoy it, but retrospect, there are crucible experiences that form who you are today. Um, so just be patient and, and, um, and don't give up on the, on the ambition. Just, just temper yourself. Mm, that's beautiful. Any leadership books or, you know, anything you're reading right now that you highly recommend that our listeners might check out to get a little more insight into the things that you're into? Well, I've been doing a lot of, uh, oddly, um, I mean, I was just talking to someone else about it and you're going to think that this was scripted, but uh, Tribes is, is a book that I'm reading by Seth Godin. And um, the reason I like it is it takes an anthropo anthropological view of how um, people come together. And um, when, I, when, I, when I think about what's happening over the last three years and the role of chief HR officer has shifted a little bit to incorporate chief crisis officer, I wanted to get an understanding, you know, is this here to stay or is this just something of the moment? And my, my belief is that it is here to stay because the world has shifted. Yeah. Whether it's the movement coming out of social justice it's this, um, you know, trust with leadership and, and, and politicians is at an all-time low. Um, engagement levels have plummeted. Uh, and then you've got hybrid work, future work, gig work, et cetera, et cetera. Everything's changing. And then AI, and you've got employee activism with social media. And, and so you can't just put in policies that say you can't talk about this. Just, we don't live in that world anymore. So I wanted right. to take a deeper dive to understand how are people organized and what this book does, has taught me so far is that at the end of the day, it's more about similarities than differences. Mm. And there are some fundamental principles about people coming together and, and the power of solidarity and how you harness that for, for collective good and, and creating more culture carriers rather than disruptors. So I'm doing a lot of work around this. Uh, Keith Farazi, who's um, you know, an author and, and has, has, has become a good friend, has been talking about employee civility with me. And um, I'm really leaning into that because I think we need to do some work as HR leaders around redefining what we mean by mutual respect in the organization. Um, it's, really, it's really, on one hand, geeky, but on the other hand, really exciting space to, to look at. Well, it goes back to the mind-body connection, which is what I think you are all really focused on, because ultimately when you have unhealthy people, either in mind or body, you have a, at, a, at an organization level, it's really hard to be healthy organizationally. Yeah. Whereas when you have healthy people at a mind and body level, it's a lot easier to create healthy organizations. There's something at the individual level that needs to be solved for before we start throwing culture on top of it and saying, you know, come on guys, we got a great purpose statement. <laughs> yeah. People are living in fight or flight mode. That's not going to resonate, you know? Yeah. Look, th this might be a bit of a hot take, but you know, I, I think that we, we've got to pause on how we talk about um, great place to work and, and that, We've got the best culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I get that. I understand the value of it and why it's important. But we've got to recognize that we're living in strange moments at the moment. We've gone through a yeah. pandemic. Um, there's political discourse. There's war. Uh, people are just not feeling good right now. Mental health issues are at an all-time high. We can't expect people to just put that on pause and come into work, and all of a sudden, work life is great. People bring yeah. that in. It's lived experiences. So rather than trying to pretend that doesn't exist, I think we've got to work with it and be more empathetic to understand how can we meet you where you are and at the same time understand that we've got value to create and that there's a purpose that we have, at least at our company, that by working together, we can make a difference in society. And I, I, I think that is a hot take and it is fantastic take, frankly, and the future of work is that 
corporations have a responsibility to solve that problem because corporations are the new town square. We used to gather in the town square for community, for learning, for nurturing, and we don't have that anymore. And so now where we come together is at work, where professional and personal development happens is at work, thanks to the L&D departments, right? The social activism now is happening at work. Did you see those people protesting in the Google offices? I mean, this is where we come together now. So I think there is a responsibility of corporations to help employees and their members or customers, whatever their business is, to get to, to be better, you know, to, to heal. And yeah, I, I totally agree. And I'm so glad that you're in the position that you are leading the charge on that. And I can't wait to see what else comes from you and Equinox and the rest of the team. My last question, which is my favorite question, is what is one thing that you don't get asked in these types of interviews that you wish more people would ask? I, I, so no one ever asked me why I um, got back into HR. So, it, you know, it's interesting because I left HR and I went into a, a PL role running Adidas Canada. And it seems to be um, almost um, a negative sentiment that you broke out of HR. Why did you come back to it? And, mm -hmm. and I think partly it's probably FOMO. I always suffer from FOMO. But I think everything that's happening right now in the world you know, we just talked about has a huge impact around how employee experience and leadership and operating models have to adjust so many discontinuities. Um, and so I, I just think that being in this role in the, in the people leader, it's a huge privilege, but also a huge responsibility. And I, I think that, you know, that's where we can make the greatest impact. So I, I, I encourage more people to um, leave business roles and come into the, into the, into the HR role because um, now is the time. I love that. Well, thank you, Aleem. It was such a pleasure. If people want to learn more about you or about Equinox, where can they go? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best for, for finding me. Um, if you can find me on Insta and TikTok, you've got great stalking skills and uh, go for it. Um, but of course, <laughs> uh, Equinox.com and we're, we're always looking for great talent uh, and, and so happy to hear from people. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was such a wonderful chat. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to Culture Leaders. I'm Dr. Jessica Kriegel, hoping you found inspiration in today's story. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a review and share your thoughts. And thanks for listening. To connect and learn more about today's guest, visit the link section on this episode's show notes. Please be sure to connect with Jessica and the show at jessicakriegel.com. There, you'll be able to see all the episodes and learn more about transforming culture at your organization. This episode is a Culture Partners production. Until next time, keep shaping a positive culture. Thanks for listening.